Right. So the plan um, for today is to talk about more with, about relations, um, and in particular, what are called equivalence relations. Um, so this would be section 11.3 in the text. Um, so we pretty much have all of the ingredients that we need to um, work with equivalence relations. So it's an equivalence relation is a relation as you um, hopefully read for the quiz that satisfies three properties, flexive, symmetric, and transitive. So if we have a relation that satisfies those three properties, then we call this an equivalence relation. And um, what is particularly nice about these three properties, you might be thinking like, why do we care that it has reflexive, symmetric, and transitive? And it's because um, this will allow us to partition this set into a bunch of disjoint um, equivalence classes, what we'll call classes. So we'll see that this is gonna be, um, these properties will lend itself nicely um, in the next section. Um, okay, so if we're going to try and prove uh, a relation is uh, an equivalence relation, which is what a lot of your next um, homework asks you to do. And I just want to let you guys know that the homework for next week is due Wednesday as opposed to Monday. So you have um, some extra time to work on that next week. Um, then there's three things that we need to do. So we, we actually have been doing this. This is what we did last class is we would need to show that that relation is reflexive. So for all elements in the set, X is related to itself. Um, we want to show that it's symmetric, meaning if X is related to Y, then it should follow that Y is related to X. And we want to prove that it's transitive. Um, so when we're proving the reflexive property, that's like a for all statement that we need to prove. Um, when we're proving the symmetric and transitive properties, these are conditional statements. So it's an if then. Um, and so when we're doing symmetric, um, we are assuming one thing. So here's our kind of hypothesis, and then we want to prove this. So um, ideally, we can do that with direct proof, but you might need to use contrapositive or contradiction could work for those. Um, and with transitive properties, then we're going to assume two things are true. We have two things in our hypothesis, and then we want to prove um, this. Uh, so before we get started with um, first example, any, any questions, um, either general about the course or, or specific to this material? Um, okay, so um, then let's let's take a look at how these go. And um, we essentially have done a lot of these proofs last time when we went through and we're looking at all of these different relations and we were saying, is it reflexive, symmetric, transitive, et cetera. So I just want to formalize that process. So um, let's consider this parity relationship. So we're going to say, first of all, the set that we're working with are integers. And we're going to say two integers are going to be related by P if they have the same parity. So if they're both even or if they're both odd. Man, my dog, that was the longest she stayed for class. That was four minutes. Um, that's impressive. <laughs> um, okay. So um, that means there, there are then three things that we're going to have to show. So let me um, kind of just come over here. We can kind of break it up. So um, we're going to claim, first of all, with these problems, we need to think about whether or not we think they're equivalence relations or not. So for the parity, um, relation, we've seen this before, Th this, my claim here is that this is indeed an equivalence relation. So how we can structure these proofs are we're going to structure it so that first let's do the reflexive part, then let's do the symmetric part, and then let's do the transitive part. So it's good to indicate to the reader which of these things you're, you're proving. So we start with the reflexive um, Properties. So what this is going to say, what we need to show is that for any integer x, it is going to be related to itself by this property, by this relation. And um, so here for the reflexive, there's not too much to say. This is usually the easiest of the three. 
is okay, X has the same parity as itself, so it would therefore be related to itself. Um, so any, any questions about what we need to show um, in that reflexive step, either in, in general or for this example? Okay, then um, we could go ahead and do the symmetric property. And so now for this, um, first of all, we're gonna need two elements in here. So now we have like X and Y, and we're gonna assume that X and Y, X is related to Y. And what we're hoping to show again is we want to show that therefore Y is related to X. Um, which is pretty short um, connection there as well for this one. Um, so if X has the same parity as Y, then Y has the same parity of X. So Y would be related to X. But um, let me just say like for this stage, these proofs are all going to look very, very similar, at least how we start them out. We're going to need two elements that come from our set the set that the relation is defined on might be different for different problems. In this case, it's integers. And we also are gonna start with the assumption that these two elements are related um, by the relation. Um, and then the last one, which I would say that these properties tend to get a little bit trickier to prove generally as we move down. So the transitive one um, might be a little bit trickier in some cases. So now we need um, three elements in this set. And the assumption here is two things, that X is related to Y and Y is related to Z. Um, and it's a conditional statement. So then we're hoping to show that if this stuff is true, then X is related to Z. Uh, and so, in this one, all, all of these properties, I think are, um, we don't have to go through too many hoops to, to, to make these connections in this case. Um, so if we want to prove that it's transitive, then we would say, okay, if X is related to Y, then X and Y, they have the same parity. If Y is related to Z, then Y and Z have the same parity. Um, so therefore X and Z have the same parity. And then we can put our little closed box over here and that's it, right? So the proof is prove one, two, three properties about that relation. And so um, just to kind of color code, like here's kind of what we would, the green stuff is what we would kind of start with in each of these proofs. Um, and I don't know how this will look highlighted. Um, and kind of this pink stuff is what you would want to show in each of these cases. And it's mostly going to be the same um, in all of these situations. Just the letter might be R instead of P, the set might be R instead of Z, we might just have slightly different notation. Okay, are any, any questions? About that? I just have a question for like all the this in general. Mm -hmm. So for each one of these proofs, we have to prove that it's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, you get three proofs for the price of one. Yes. Um, okay. So um, if there aren't any questions, then let's. Take a look at this second one um, together. So this deals with how we can, um, how we define congruence of two integers by this mod n relation. Um, and so I, these are really nice equivalence classes. So it's nice to kind of get used to this modular arithmetic. And so um, in red is how the textbook defines um, what it means for two numbers to be congruent mod n. 
Um, and the way the book does it is they say, um, if n divides the difference between a and b, then a and b are congruent mod n. Um, and this might look different than how we defined it. The way that we defined it was, was more along these lines over here. And I just want to be sure that um, you're comfortable with these two definitions, though seemingly different, they're equivalent definitions. Um, so if I say that n divides the difference of a and b, then it's the same thing as saying a minus b is um, equal to n times some integer, which um, is equivalent to kind of rearranging these as well. Um, so down here, this is kind of how we might kind of think about this as like, um, we think of mod things as like, what is the remainder when I divide by n? Um, yeah, so um, for example, let's say I have, um, It was really, I dropped my Apple Pencil, um, in case you guys are wondering. Um, and they, they <laughs> like the tip of it popped off. So now it's like, cause this is like 130 bucks. So now like I've taped it together very precariously. And it's almost like a broken pen. Like sometimes it writes really thick and sometimes it writes really thin. Um, and I don't understand why. Um, but anyway, um, unrelated to this. So let's say um, we've got 15 and we wanna know what is it congruent to mod um, seven? This is really starting to fade on me. Um, then like one way that probably people most likely think about this is they say, okay, well, when we divide 15 by seven, um, we have a remainder of one. So that's probably typically how you might think about it. Um, and what the textbook is saying is we'll notice um, seven divides 15 minus one because one is the remainder. So if we take that remainder away, seven should divide it evenly. Um, and so we could say 15 is congruent to one mod seven. We could say 15 is um, is congruent to 31 mod seven because 15 and 31, they both have the same remainder when we divide by seven. Um, but it's just that more commonly, we tend to do it so that um, we identify it as like a number less than seven, an integer less than seven. So this might look a little bit um, odd on the bottom that usually we kind of restrict ourselves to saying, well, let's think about um, the right side as being some number between zero and six. Um, so I'll just say like, it, it, <clears throat> it's good to be comfortable with both these definitions. One, like thinking about it as a remainder sort of thing and the other thinking about it like this. And we'll kind of see the advantage to this definition when we try and prove this statement over here. Um, but. Any, any questions about? I have a question. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, that last one. Am, am I missing something? Mm, you probably are. That probably doesn't divide that evenly. Um, let me change no, that. You need a uh, um, 29. 36, how about that? That was okay, just checking, way. thank you. <laughs> just making sure, yep. Yeah, and that looks weird. We typically wouldn't say 15 is congruent to 36 mod seven. We would usually say one. And kind of where we're heading to um, with all of this is that this relation is indeed an equivalence relation. So we can prove that in a second. And so what it's gonna do is it's gonna partition all of the integers into here are integers um, that are divisible by seven. And then we have another set of integers that have a remainder of one when we divide by seven. 
And it's going to allow us to partition all of the integers into subsets that all are related by this relation. Um, but that's maybe getting slightly uh, ahead of where we're at right now. So for now, let's just focus on showing like, why is this an equivalence relation? Okay, and so again, um, the relation here in two is equivalence mod seven. So we're gonna say two numbers um, are equivalent if they are congruent mod seven. And um, so this, if I'm gonna use this um, division type of definition that says they are gonna be congruent if seven divides their difference evenly without a, a remainder. So um, for the reflexive property, you know, just to see how it's similar to what we did up here, we just start with any element in our set. In this case, our, our set again is, is an integer. Um, and then what we're hoping to show is that A is related to itself. Um, and here, that is the case since um, seven divides A minus A, which is zero. Um, sorry, I see something in the chat. Ah. Okay, um, any, any questions about that one? If you're kind of wondering, um, you know, why does seven divide zero, um, like any number, any integer is a divisor of zero, since we can write it as zero times any integer. Um, <laughs> yes, I think I was getting at this point over here. That's what I want to say. Okay, yeah, and so kind of this second remark is just what I was trying to um, mention above. Um, that it might seem weird to say 15 is related, is congruent to 36, um, but it's okay to do that. It's just not typically what we do. Okay, um, and so then for symmetric property, as the previous case, then we would start with two integers which are related to each other mod seven. And again, the hope is to show that we can flip the A and the B around and the relation still holds. That's where the symmetric property would come in. Um, and using this definition for um, congruence mod seven, this is really nice um, since, right, we've got this fact that, okay, this we assumed, so this we can start with. So we start with the fact that, okay, A and B are congruent. So seven has to divide A minus B. What does that mean? Well, that means um, seven is equal to um, A minus B times K. Um, no, sorry. There's a problem there. What did I do wrong there? 7k equals a minus b. That's right. Very good. Making these mistakes on purpose, just to make sure you guys are correcting my error. Okay, um, let me fix that. Okay. Um, so what I mean here is if seven divides a minus b, then we've got a minus b is equal to um, seven k for some integer k. Let me fix that too. And um, what we're hoping to show is that seven also divides b minus a, right? That would allow us to then say that b is congruent to a mod seven. Um, so here I could just multiply both sides by minus one and say, well, then B minus A is equal to seven times minus K. 
where minus k is an integer. So that implies 7 divides b minus a evenly. Therefore, b is congruent to a mod 7. Uh, any any questions? And um, it's just good to note that we have very similar kind of assumption as we did in the previous case. We take two elements that are related to each other, and then we're just hoping to show that that is going to imply that we can flip them around. Do you have to say negative k, or can you just say b minus a would work for seven times some other integer? Um, well, we don't know it would, I mean, right? We know that it works for some other integer because um, it depends on this previous thing. So it is important to kind of note how, like the integer here is not totally unrelated to the integer here. And that's actually the key part there. So it's the fact that there is some k um, that exists that allows us to do this, that's going to be able to allow us to claim that there is an integer that I could put here that makes this equal. Okay. So like if I just put um, something like this, right, then you might ask, well, like, well, why, right? I mean, you might be able to read that and be okay with it, but I think um, you shouldn't assume that all readers might be able to make that leap. So just putting that extra detail in there certainly doesn't doesn't hurt. Um, so sometimes you, you might say like j where j is equal to minus k and that, that gets at the same point. Okay. Um, and then for the transitive property right now, we need to take three things so that A is related to B, B is related to C, and then we're going to hope to show that therefore A and C are related. Um, and so here we can kind of use this idea that um, if 7 divides A minus B, and seven divides b minus c, then we can write a minus b as seven times some integer. We can write b minus c as seven times some other integer. And then if I add a minus b, or excuse me, if I subtract a minus b and b minus c, then what we get left is a minus c. Um, and that's great since a minus b and b minus c um, are 7k and 7j respectively, then we have that a minus c is equal to seven times some integer. Um, any questions? I think the, the textbook has, has this um, proof in there as, as well, but the textbook was using that division definition. So I just wanted to make sure that, um, that that was clear because we have been working with like this remainder type of definition. Okay, I take silence as um, good or bad. Is that good? <laughs> Are there any, any questions? Isn't the, um, shouldn't it be A minus B plus B minus C is A minus C? Or... Uh, yeah, I think you're right, actually. I think we do want a plus there, right? Um, yeah, I know that that's what gets A minus C. I'm just not sure if that's supposed to be yeah, uh, you're right. So if I put a problem. plus there, then the b's cancel, and I get an a minus a c, and so that means I should have a plus here. Thank you. And a plus there. Yep. Yeah.
Okay, and um, I'll just say we actually just proved um, three as well because there was nothing special about seven anywhere in that proof. So if you go back into this proof um, and replace every seven with some arbitrary integer n, um, nothing that we did depended on seven, right, in this proof. And that's the nice advantage here. Did you just say here using seven without loss of generality? Is that the same idea? Um, so I think that if you were trying to prove it for the general case of n, and you say, well, without loss of generality, let's just pick n equals seven, um, it might seem weird because then you would have to go through the proof and then after the fact say, hey, look, like nothing was dependent on seven, so this works for any integer n, um, which that kind of logic is okay, but I just think it's cleaner just to say, well, let's just let n be arbitrary from the get-go and then just go through this proof. Um, but I think it helps to see it first with like a concrete number like seven maybe before we just were to make that leap and say, well, let, it doesn't matter that we picked seven here. Um, but it doesn't matter that we pick seven here. Um, all right, questions? Okay, um, so that takes care of the first three then. Um, so now let's think about here. So now we're gonna think about L as the set of all lines in the Cartesian plane. So Cartesian plane, we just mean x, y. Kind of our um, collection is the set of all lines in the plane. And so um, here we're saying that like L1 and L2 are gonna be related to each other if they're perpendicular to each other. And um, so this, these questions are saying, let's consider whether or not this is an equivalence relation. If it is, prove it. If it's not, disprove it. So um, what are your thoughts on this relation? You think it is gonna satisfy um, reflexive, symmetric, and transitive? No, I don't think so. Okay, uh, which ones don't you think it will satisfy? Reflexive? Yeah. So if I take L1 right here, it is not perpendicular to itself, right? It is parallel to itself. Um, so if we want to prove whether or not this is an equivalence relation, then the first thing is to kind of think about, is it an equivalence relation? Okay. I don't think that it is because lines are not perpendicular to themselves. So then um, let's prove that. And we can prove, for example, that this is not reflexive. So let's take a line, L1, which is in this collection of uh, lines. So since this is not perpendicular to itself, then we would say that L1 is not related by relation P to itself. 
Okay, and that, that's all we would need to say as far as disprove. We don't need to disprove all of them. We just need to find that one of them doesn't work. Um, Stephanie, did, did you have a question? Sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. You just answered it. Yeah. So it, it, it also is not transitive. Let me just say that, right? So you have a line, you have another line, and then you have another line, which is perpendicular to it. And in fact, if you go through the transitive property and you say, well, L1 is perpendicular to L2, L2 is perpendicular to L3, then L1 and L3 are actually not perpendicular to each other, but they would be parallel to each other. So you might have an L1 over here, an L2 that I've drawn, and um, right, this could be an L3 over here. And now we can see that L1 and L3 are not related to each other by this relation. So it also fails the transitive property. Um, but yeah, showing that it's not reflexive is enough. You could just say, look, it's not transitive and that's enough. Um, it is symmetric, but it doesn't satisfy the other two. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, you guys feel comfortable? Try and do some of these, practice some of these. All right, I will take that as an overwhelming vote of confidence that we are ready to do these. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's start with this um, fifth one. And um, so I'll just break us up into breakout rooms and give you guys a chance to work through um, as much or as little as you can. Um, so the first one would be five. And let me just say, um, this one is an equivalence relation to help you out with your first one. So the task would be to show it's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Um, for the other relations, as if you get through five and you move on to some of the others, I'll leave it for your groups to think about whether or not they are or aren't equivalence relations, and then try and, and prove that claim. Um, but I would definitely encourage you, as you're writing out your proofs, to um, you know, really try and structure them in this nice way where you've got reflexive, symmetric, transitive. That helps um, the reader a lot follow what you're doing. No questions? Not yet. All right. Um, let's see. Um, so the rooms are are open. Um, so um, Nat and I will be checking in to see how you guys are doing. Um, just let us know if you have any questions. All right, hey everyone. Um, great, so let's um, just touch base and see if you have any questions um, about these problems, but seemed like after um, adjusting to power sets, <laughs> what are power sets again, um, that seemed to be the, the bigger stumbling block maybe than actually um, trying to hash out the details of these properties. Um, okay, so for um, five, yes, yeah, so this one was an equivalence relation. Um, and so just to kind of talk about ways that we could justify um, these things, really what we're, sorry if I'm making you dizzy with flying around through my thing here is really what we're trying to say is, you know, the, here's the key sentence right here, which is, uh, right, these guys are gonna be equivalent if A has the same um, smallest element of B. So um, if I wanna show that it's reflexive, then I wanna show that set A has the same so smallest element as itself. And um, yeah, that's pretty self-evident. Um, so there's not too much that you need to expand on for that, but at least what you should be comfortable with is that's what we need to claim. Somehow I need to show that the smallest element of A is the smallest element of A. 
So yes, that works for the reflexive part. Um, for the symmetric part, um, yeah, I mean, really, it's just like changing the subject and the object of that sentence in some sense, right? We're saying, OK, if A is related to B, then the smallest element of A equals the smallest element of B. Therefore, the smallest element of B is equal to the smallest element of A. So B is related to A. Um, I know that some groups said, um, let X be the smallest element of A. Then we're assuming B has the smallest element, which is also equal to X. And you could kind of argue that way by actually claiming what the smallest element is. Um, so that, that's fine too. Um, and then, you know, transitive property follows pretty um, similarly that, okay, A and B have the smallest element, which is equal to each other. And then C smallest element equals B. Therefore, A and C have to have the same smallest element. Um, any any questions or any difference in, in how groups were approaching that one? Um, okay, then um, in six, right, this one was not an equivalence relation. So now we're changing it so that we're not saying smallest elements are equal, but we're going to say a and B are related if the smallest element of A is less than or equal to the smallest element of B. Um, so in that case, the reflexive property is fine, um, but it's gonna be the symmetric property when, whenever you have these ordering relations that are gonna be an issue. Um, so here is a very concrete example for why that wouldn't work. So um, just to kind of compare these two, like when you're proving something is a relation, we need to do this very, very generally and, and be able to apply this to like any, so this element could apply to any um, elements from the set. Whereas when we're disproving something, then it's totally fine to just give one concrete counter example. Uh, okay, so we're, okay, um, so for, so are, are there any questions about five or six? Okay, um, so for question number seven, um, some group want to share what you came up with for, for that one, Who, if anyone has gotten to it. I can do that. Sure. So our group said number seven um, is not an equivalence relation because the transitive property wasn't true. Okay, I'll finish that sentence. So you're going to claim this is not an equivalence relation and you said um, the transitive property? Right. Okay, so we'll claim that this is not um, transitive. And what, how did you prove that? So we just came up with three different sets. Okay. Um, A was one and two. B was two and three. Okay. And, and C was three and four. And then, so you, you can say that A, the relation A and B is true because it's not an empty set. B and C is true because it's not an empty set. But A and C is not true since it is a null set. That would work. Um, so yeah, for those, again, uh, we can be very specific when we're disproving something, right? So we're kind of disproving this by counter example. Uh, 
Um, yeah, otherwise, the other properties were fine, right? It is reflexive um, and it is transitive, or excuse me, it is symmetric, it's just not transitive. Uh, okay. The, the, um, I don't think the groups that I were speaking with got the eight or nine, um, but I missed the group that Nat was in charge of. Um, how, how far did, did you guys get? Nat, um, or anybody else who was in that room, Brent, how far did you guys get? Oh, we were still working on six. Okay, yeah, that's about what I saw in with the groups as well, yeah. Um, okay, so let me let me kind of just leave eight and nine out there. Um, I'll, I'll put up the solutions for those. I think those are good for you to think about. One is a relation, one is not a relation. Um, but maybe with the last couple minutes, um, I just want to connect this into the next section um, and we'll wrap up this material on Monday and that will conclude kind of the stuff that's going to be on your exam, which mind you has now been pushed back, right? So the exam is not a week from today, but whatever it was, November 9th, I think the, the Monday. Um, so um, next time we'll, we'll kind of get into this worksheet. It's up online on what are called equivalence classes. Um, and what's really nice about these, a relation that defines an equivalence relation is that it allows us to um, partition the set into a bunch of equivalence, different equivalence classes. Um, so again, how you might think about that is if we take all of the integers, then we can place them into classes based on what are they congruent to mod five, right? And so then we can take all of these integers Z and we can break them down into here's one equivalence class of all things that are zero mod five. And then we can come up with an equivalence class of all of the integers I don't know why I'm just picking positive ones, but um, we can do one and six and et cetera that are all equivalent to one mod five. And this gives us a nice way of saying integers are lots of them, but by this relation, we can break down all integers and just group them into four disjoint subsets of the integers. And all of the elements in each of those subsets um, are equivalent to each other via this um, relation. So um, we'll kind of see why these properties of symmetry, reflexive, transit, transitive allow us to come up with these nice partitions of a set. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that next time. Um, if you want to read ahead on that, um, that's section 11.4. And that's going to stop the material for this next exam. So. Um, let me just say for the next exam, it's going to be proving things. So um, that's induction. Don't forget about direct proof, contrapositive proof, um, and proof by contradiction. So it's basically going to be all of these proof techniques that we've been doing, um, focus on induction. And um, you should be prepared to think about, in particular, doing like equivalence class um, proofs. So. Um, I don't want to tell you that like the exam isn't cumulative because the course, <laughs> the content in the course is cumulative, of course, um, but the focus is going to be on the concepts that we've learned since the last exam. Um, but that doesn't mean that things like parity and things like contrapositive and all these other things, we still need to know those things to do these proofs. Um, but we can, we can talk more about the exam um, next week. So for now, um, for the weekend, at least you've got the next homework assignment is up. Um, so you can start working away on that. If you've got questions, I have office hours um, tomorrow. And then we'll, uh, on Monday, we'll wrap up this and we can talk um, 
a little bit, yeah, maybe we'll talk a little bit about the exam on, on Monday, or excuse me, on, on Wednesday of next week. Um, but we'll also talk about some content next week that won't be on the exam, just so you know. So we'll move into chapter 12 um, next week, but that won't be on the exam. Um, 